Hello, good day to one and all. This is Ms. A. Krishna Sundar, Assistant Professor, Department of English, KAHM Unity Women's College, Mancheri. Today we are going to discuss Unit 6, titled as Mechanics and Conventions of Writing from the Text, Writing for Academic and Professional Success. So we had already gone through the first part of this unit where we had discussed some punctuation marks including comma, semicolon, colon, double quotation mark, single quotation mark and apostrophe. So here in part 2 we are going to continue with the discussion on punctuation marks. So here we move on with the next one. This is parenthesis. Now parenthesis as we have seen is the curved bracket. So the first situation in which a parenthesis can be used is to set off an information. When you are giving an extra piece of information, the present minister has agreed to inaugurate a program. So this is a full sentence but now you are giving an additional information and in bracket, in parenthesis, you are quoting 1998 batch of our college. So this is an extra information about the present minister. Now the second situation is to expand and clarify a term. REC tickets are hard to get confirmed. So here you are expanding and clarifying regarding the term REC, that is reservation against cancellation. Now the third one is to insert dates or year. Kalam was 11th president of India and in between you are mentioning the date or the year. Now parenthesis is quite often used for in-text citation in academic work. Now in-text citation means suppose you are writing an assignment on a topic given by your teacher. In order to write your assignment you would be looking at a number of works or books or journals or articles. So definitely you would be quoting from other writers. You would have taken ideas from other people. So you have to acknowledge this in your assignment and to acknowledge this you will have to mention the name of the writer or sometimes the book written by the writer and for this again parenthesis can be used. But again this might be different for different disciplines because the kind of guidelines that you get in literature will not be the same when you go for a scientific kind of discipline. So moving on to the next one, here we have brackets. So by bracket here we are talking about square brackets. So the first situation is to insert a clarification. You can't take it with you. So it, what is this it? It is your money. So you have put that in the bracket. The second situation is to explain a translation. The essay discusses ad valorem in detail. Now in bracket you write what is this ad valorem according to value. Now situation number three, parenthesis within parenthesis. Now look at the sentence, electromagnetism determined many phases of technology. Now this is a sentence. So now you are giving an additional information about electromagnetism and that is why you are using parenthesis. Remember we studied situation number one in parenthesis is to give an additional information. So here the additional information is a branch of physics. Now again within that branch of physics you are going to talk about something more or maybe you are giving a better clarification here and that is why you are using the bracket which was a great invention. So parenthesis within parenthesis. So moving on to the next one dash. Now dash is a longer one whereas hyphen is a shorter one. So that is the main difference. So coming to the first situation to replace a comma or parenthesis. No student, not even the leader, was present for the function. So this not even the leader could have been separated with a comma or could have been placed inside a parenthesis. But if you want to use a dash, you can also use a dash. Now situation number two, to indicate a break in the flow of a sentence. So this is a sentence, Kiran could not pass all his exams and so he was not eligible to attend the job fair. Now this is a sentence but you are bringing a break in between. 
you are actually stopping the flow of the sentence by giving an additional phrase here. Many of his friends were worse compared to him. So you are trying to prove that he has done a better job. So you are trying to break the flow within the same sentence. Now the third situation is to give emphasis. He was absent for the program. Now that is a normal sentence but you are trying to emphasize one part of it. He, the real leader was absent for the program. So giving emphasis. Now the fourth one is to indicate page numbers. The chapter is from page 12 to 34. The seminar is scheduled between July 15 to 25. So to indicate page numbers. Now moving on to the next one. This is hyphen. Now a hyphen is used if the adjective comes before a noun. Now see the difference then you will understand it. Well written article. So the adjective comes before the noun. The noun here is article. So the adjective well written is coming before the noun and that is why the hyphen is used. At the same time I am going to rewrite the very same piece. Arun's article was well written. So see, Arun's article was well written and here in well written we are not making use of a hyphen because we make use of this hyphen only when the adjective comes before a noun. Now the second situation is compound numbers less than 100 like 24, 37, 48 etc. Now this is also used between prefixes like anti-American, pre-2000, post-COVID, etc. So moving on to the next one, this is period. Now period is actually a full stop. So there is a general rule, usually in English, all sentences end with a period. So that is a general kind of statement, so it doesn't require any kind of examples. Now the second one, an indirect question ends with a period. He inquired why I was late. So that is an indirect question. Now the third one as ellipsis or omission. Now you might have seen when you read certain textbooks or sometimes when you read certain articles or journals, you might have noticed three dots coming together. Now this usually comes when something is quoted from another text or from another author. So what happens here is that if the quotation is very very long, you will not be writing the entire quotation. Instead, you would be just using this ellipsis. Which means if you put these three dots together, it is understood that the quotation is still running on but you are not mentioning it. So that is a third situation. Now please see there is a mistake. The next one, periods in bracket is fourth and abbreviations would be fifth. So the number has gone mistaken. So coming to the fourth one, periods in bracket. Now if the parenthesis contains a phrase. Now see, you won't get rooms in Munad during Jan, Feb. And you can see in bracket, you can see the peak season. So if this parenthesis is containing a phrase, the full stop will come after the parenthesis, outside the parenthesis. Now, if the parenthesis contains a full sentence, you won't get rooms in Munna during January, February. And now the bracket starts. It is very tough to get rooms in Alapura as well. So that is a full sentence which is coming within the bracket and because of that the full stop will happen inside the parenthesis. If it is a phrase it happens outside the parenthesis. Now the last one this is a fifth one where periods are used for abbreviations. Example etc. AM, MA, BA, BSC etc. So it stands for something which can be expanded. Now moving on to the last one, this is capitalization. So this is a very simple thing because most of you might know when or how it is used. Now the first situation is as main words of a title, a song for the suppressed. You can see S is capitalized and S, the second S suppressed, S is also capitalized. Now you can see the second situation is for proper nouns like Bill Gates, Italy, Mother Teresa, Gandhiji, United Kingdom, etc. Then comes days and months, Tuesday, Wednesday, March, April, 
etc. So these are the three situations in which capitalization can be used. So now we come to the end of punctuation marks and we are moving into the next part which is titled as academic style or as you can say academic integrity which is more important within academic style. So first of all we all know that there are both academic writings and non-academic writings. Now suppose you are talking to your friend over a whatsapp chat and you are discussing politics, you would be giving a number of statements to justify your point within the WhatsApp chat. Now, this WhatsApp chat in which you are discussing politics will not be considered as an academic writing. But at the same time, if your teacher is giving you an assignment and asking you to substantiate your point in some political topics, what you write will become an academic writing. So, first of all, you have to understand the difference between academic writing and non-academic writing. So, academic writing will include your assignments, your examination papers, your project, your seminar report, your thesis, etc. Now, there are certain guidelines which you have to follow when you are into academic writing. You just can't write and bluff and go because that will not give you a kind of quality for your work. So, stylistic consistency is an important yardstick. So, there are certain regulations. Remember, in the last video lecture, we discussed what is a style guide. A style guide is something like giving you guidelines on how to write. So, stylistic consistency is very important because this defines the quality of your work. At the same time, you have to follow certain documentation styles. We'll come into more details in the coming slides and this documentation style would be completely dependent upon your disciplines. As I have mentioned before, if you are from the literature discipline, the way in which you would be documenting would be different from the way in which a science student will be doing their documentation. So now let's move on to the term documentation. So let me put this term into simpler version. So what is documentation? If you are to write an assignment on online classes during COVID scenario, you will have your own ideas but definitely you are going to read a number of articles or works written by other people. Sometimes you might be checking some books from the library or sometimes you would be doing a Google search. Whatever it may be, you would be picking up some ideas from some other people and definitely when you are picking ideas from someone else, you have to document it. You have to mention that. You have to acknowledge that. If you are not acknowledging that, it is equivalent to theft. So, since it is a writing, you won't use the term theft. Instead, we would be using the term plagiarism. So, plagiarism is actually copying someone else's ideas or copying someone else's words. So, documentation, as we have discussed before, for arts and humanities, you use the MLA style. So, please remember these names and the expansion to MLA means Modern Language Association, US. Now, if you are a science student, you would be following APA style, that is American Psychological Association, again US. Now, there are two types of documentation. When you write an assignment or when you write a project, there are two types of documentation coming. One is in-text documentation. Now, in-text documentation means within your assignment, while you write the different paragraphs, you would be quoting ideas from another author. And in that case, you will have to cite it within the assignment itself. And that is what you call as in-text documentation. This is otherwise known as parenthetical documentation. Now, there is another kind of documentation which is known as a reference. Now, if you check certain books, maybe projects or sometimes certain study books, you can see at the last part of the book, there would be a title like reference or work cited and a huge list of books would be given. Now, this is actually the list which had been 
put into use in order to write this book. So similarly, if you are writing an assignment, if you have gone through 20 books and if you have read 20 others or if you are quoting from those writings, you will have to mention the names of all those 20 books in the reference or work cited. Now this is also known as bibliography. So this is the complete list of the books you have used whereas in-text documentation means whichever line you are quoting you are just documenting that line. So I'll tell you the example here. Now just look at this one. This later haunted his mind with the convictions that there exists in one way or another a mysterious bond between man and nature. So say in parenthesis Yaka 11 to 12. Now this is in-text citation. This comes as a part of your assignment, within your assignment or within your project. So here you are mentioning Yaka 11 to 12, which means this particular line has been taken from the author Yaka and it is in page number 11 to 12. But now the question comes, which book of Yaka, which year you have all these doubts. So if you want to get a more clarity over this yaka, you will have to go to the last page where the entire list comes, that is a work cited page or the reference page. If you go to the reference page, now the reference page would be in alphabetical order, which means this name yaka would come at the end. So here, look at the reference, yaka PM, his full name is there, introduction, the Prelude, William Wordsworth, that is the title of the book. London, the place where the book was published. Routledge and Kegan Paul, so that is the publishing company. The year 1988 and the page number 11 to 135. So that's a very huge book. And out of this book, you have taken only one single line between page 11 and 12. So this is the difference between in-text citation and reference. So now, as we have discussed, there are two styles of documentation. One is MLA style and then comes APA style. So now we are going into the first part, that is MLA style. Now this is meant for arts and humanities group. Now this kind of a publishing style guide started in the year 1985 and since then there are a number of editions coming in and the latest edition is in the year 2016 with a lot of changes. So today the latest version is MLA Handbook 8th edition. You can see the picture here on the left hand corner. So this is MLA Handbook 8th edition which is the latest edition. Now this is the book which literature students mostly depend on. Now, myself being a teacher in literature, this is like a guidebook for the teachers, students and research scholars. Now, this will give you a wide range of sources about so many things in academic writing. It talks about text formatting, the margin that you should leave, it deals with illustrations, tables, how to do correction, how to record page number, how to do the binding, paper, printing, uh, size of the font and plagiarism. So here with MLA style, the importance is all the page citation. Remember, Yaka, page number 11 to 12. This is what we have done. So page citation is important in MLA style. Now moving on to APA style, now this is for standardizing scientific writings like empirical studies, case studies, etc. Now this book again will give you all the details like title page, abstract, introduction, the method, result. Now see method, result, etc. This normally comes in association with uh, science disciplines discussion, reference, etc. So double spacing. They will also tell you how to carry the structure or the layout. So you can use Times New Roman 12 font. So everything, even the font, the size of the font, these things are also mentioned within this book. Now one difference here is that in APA style, it is the author date citation. Remember, in MLA style, it was author page citation. Remember, Yaka. But in APA style, it is author date citation. The name of the author and then the date is given. It is not the page number. There are lots of examples given in your textbook. So you have to go through your text in order to understand them in a better way. 
So now we are talking about the most important part which is known as academic integrity. Now academic integrity means the moral and ethical code of conduct in the academic field. Now when we talk about people, when we discuss human beings, we often relate with this quality integrity because we believe that a person should have some kind of an integrity. Similarly, this integrity is equally relevant when you are talking about academic writing too. So, when you are writing something on an academic basis, you have to retain the quality. Now, the first thing is bring your own ideas. That is the first point. In case if you are taking someone else's ideas, there is nothing wrong in that. But you have to note it down. You have to acknowledge that. Suppose you are taking a few lines from the great writer Arundhati Roy. You can you can quote a number of sentences from Roy's work, but make sure you are acknowledging that. On the other hand, if you take a few lines from Arundhati Roy and say, as if this is said by you, that is plagiarism. So, to maintain academic integrity, you have to avoid plagiarism. So, teachers, students and research scholars should follow these guidelines to retain academic integrity because this will help you to maintain an academic standard and no to plagiarism. Now, sometimes plagiarism can happen accidentally. Sometimes you forget to acknowledge, sometimes you forget to write the citation, but even that would be considered as plagiarism. Now, Cobbett says, this is how Cobbett defines plagiarism. Plagiarism is copying another person's text or ideas and passing the copied material as your own work. Now, see, 20-30 years before, this kind of acknowledging was not very common. You write in your own way. You go through a number of books. You go through a number of ideas. You pick those ideas and put it in your work. Nobody actually thought about that because this was not a great issue but in today's world we live in a digital world so if you copy someone else's text and bring it to your teacher within a few seconds the teacher can find that this is from another book because today you have a number of plagiarism softwares many colleges and many teachers are actually using that and it's it's not something which is very expensive the moment you upload a document they will easily give you the parts as underlined those areas where you have copied. So the earlier method of cut, copy, paste will definitely put you into trouble and moreover, it will take away your academic integrity. Now, dishonest practices should be treated seriously. Now, using your own paper, even that is considered as a crime in academic context. It is known as self-plagiarism. Suppose, imagine I have published an article. Now, suppose I have to submit another article in some other place. If I copy my own article and place it in the other one, that is again plagiarism. It is known as self-plagiarism. So, you have to avoid plagiarism and plagiarism is copying another person's text or ideas and passing the copied material as your own work. So, there are lots of definitions given in your textbook and plagiarism is plagiarism. No matter which author you are quoting, no matter which book you are quoting, if you do that, it is plagiarism and it will take the value of your academic integrity. Now, the last part is proofreading. This is the last step before submitting your work. So, the first thing that you have to see here is to find a reviewer. Now, it can be your friend. It can be someone in your family. It can be your cousin. It can be your classmate. Anyone other than you because if another party reads your work, they can easily find the mistakes that you have committed. So, spellings. Now, this is very important. But today, if you are making it as a computer-oriented work, there are lots of options for spell check. 
the computer itself will tell you these are the places where your spellings have gone wrong then come sentences sentence construction is also very important when we talk about academic quality sometimes you write fragmented sentences sometimes subject verb agreement problem would be there sometimes run on sentences parallelism choppy kind of sentences all these are possible so you have to correct all these when you are about to submit your work your work then comes documentation which we had discussed in detail that is acknowledging the author and the book citing then comes plagiarism which again we have discussed no plagiarism then paragraphs there should be a logical kind of connection with the paragraphs from introduction and then moving on to the middle paragraphs and then finally the conclusion then comes thesis statement now whenever you write an assignment or a project you will have a thesis statement like a main sentence or a main statement so everything would be revolving around this main statement so it's like a theme an evidence or an explanation that you are trying to build up through your work so this thesis statement is also very important so with this we come to the end of part 2 and we come to the end of unit 6 now please go through the text there are many many examples given in the textbook because if you go through these examples you will understand the same theoretical part in a better way so keep these elements in your mind next time when you write an academic kind of thing maybe a project or an assignment keep these elements or keep these points in your mind and continue writing using these strategies and methods so thank you very much for your patient listening so if you have got any queries or suggestions or if you need more assistance please feel free to get connected with me in my email id so thank you very much for your patient listening thank you